The value in restoring and repurposing the most historic and iconic buildings in the city of Blackhawk goes well beyond preserving the historic edifices themselves and really speaks to the intrinsic value these buildings hold. What I believe we are doing when we preserve these historic buildings is actually honoring and preserving the indomitable spirit of the individuals that founded and built Blackhawk, remembering and reflecting on those that came before us and perhaps at the same time tapping into a bit of that indomitable spirit as we continue to make history here in the city of Blackhawk. What do we have if we don't know what went on in the past? This little area, it has so much history. Where our police department is located right now, I went to school there. And it's important to me that those buildings stay there and that, you know, we put plaques up and show what they were all about. The preservation history to me is very important. We uh, want our city to look like the city that it was prior and be able to sustain a long time of existence. I can go back in time and imagine myself being there before it was rebuilt and then now that it's restored, or how it looks almost similar to what it was a hundred years ago. I mean, it looks amazing to see how a building is being restored and redone and keeping our history preserved. I know that we're preserving history, that we're, uh, that we're making history also. Our names could go down in history as, as helping preserve this and, and making this town look as, as unique as it does. With the industry that we have now, we've got ample amount of money and we put all of it that we can towards the preservation of historic structures. Black Hawk takes great importance in preserving all of our history. A great portion is devoted to historic preservation so that we can rebuild our rock walls the way that they originally were, so that we can make sure that all of our old homes have been, have been uh, redone and are, are good and viable and strong enough to stand for another 150 years. We take pride in being the biggest contributors to that fund, the preservation fund in the state. The biggest share of, the, of those funds come from what happens in this city. The history remains because you look at it and you can say, okay, that was a school, that was a church, that, that was somebody's home. It's important to preserve history so that way future generations can see, you know, what things were like long before they were even thought of. We are trying to preserve everything that we have here, which is just an incredible wealth. It's amazing how many structures are still left. Always been into history of it. I like to see the preservation of it and for the craftsmanship that's been here before. Well, I think it's very essential for Blackhawk to preserve the storied history of the town. It's one of the oldest communities in Colorado. Anytime you, you go out and you look around and we go hiking and you see all the structures that are 150 or more years old that still remain today, it tells us uh, about uh, where we came from and, and uh, where we're headed to and where we're going in the future. So what's really interesting about the Presbyterian Church building is that it's one of the oldest standing church buildings in the state of Colorado. While there's some older congregations, this is one of the oldest buildings. And you think about it, it being built in 1863, that's 13 years before that Colorado actually became a state. During the first part of Blackhawk, that was where most everybody got information from everybody else, you know, was church. Not only that, but you know, you got to actually see friends that you haven't seen all week long because you've been spinning in the mines. To understand how significant and notable this building is to the city of Blackhawk and how appropriate and meaningful it is for it now to become the Blackhawk Council Chambers, you must look at the role it has played in Blackhawk since 1863. Yes, it was built as a Presbyterian church, but shortly after the first church services were held, public meetings were also held here. Before larger meeting halls were built in Blackhawk, noted speakers of the day would come and lecture here. The Blackhawk grade school held their commencement exercises in this building, as well as school plays. In 1907, the school purchased it from the presbytery and installed a maple wood floor, and it became the school gymnasium with a stage in the back. What we have here is a diploma from my grandfather, Otto O. Blake, dated 1925. He graduated from the Blackhawk grade school, and the graduation was held here in this building. When the school closed in the 1960s, the church building remained open so the children of Blackhawk, including myself, could use it to play basketball and volleyball. Other community groups put on plays, held bake sales, rummage sales, and other social activities. So when you stop to think about it, this building's role in Blackhawk's history, it was truly as a community center, and I can't think of a more appropriate and meaningful building 
to be the council chambers of this great city today. We're about to start a major rehabilitation project here in the city of Blackhawk. We intend to transform this 150-year-old church from a poorly insulated office space into a modern interior structure with uh, an amazing council chambers upstairs, with an amazing bell tower, and uh, adequate office space. When we first began talking about our city government now we were going to have a city hall like structure we felt that it would be better to utilize the buildings that we that we still had as opposed to building a completely new building that would actually kind of detract from what we had this is the perfect example of our historic preservation funding being used for the public good and preserving these structures so that their life can continue on you can tell by looking at the building that Colorado was still a frontier state at the time because it's built with rather simple materials that they could find locally. That's board and batten siding that goes up vertically. But still they were aspiring to something greater. So it has elements of the Gothic revival style, which was used pretty frequently for churches. For the townspeople who built this Presbyterian church back in the 1860s, I can't imagine you know, the effort that went into it. Uh, they had to blast away parts of the mountain. They took very large trees and cut them down to be used as very tall uh, framing members and built a very large simple structure that has stood for 160 years. I can't imagine how difficult it would have been to build that on the mountaintop where they did. And all the old original historic lumber that we found was in good condition, structurally sound, so that was impressive. Thinking about the foundation specifically, this stuff, they just had lumber sitting on the ground and that's how they had the foundation for their building and it lasted 150 years fine. It was a little worn, worse for wear, but it lasted. The very first congregation in this area that we call the Little Kingdom of Gilpin was actually in Central City. But Blackhawks Church was the first church building that was constructed. And it's very interesting how rapidly this church was built. They formed their congregation in the first part of the year of 1863. By June, they were um, raising money for it, and it was completed by October of that year. And in all the old, old, old pictures, you see that building. That's like the first thing you see when you come in town. And when I was going to school in the other building next to it, it used to be our gym. <laughs> the church, of course, is our annex to the city hall. It was in poor shape, worse shape than we thought. Well, there were some dangerous conditions in there. Mold and asbestos existed. It was terribly insulated. It used to be an office space before the rehab and it was just unpleasant to be in there. The building was very underutilized. Very tall exterior walls that are like 17 feet tall, probably getting up to 35 feet tall in the very middle of the building. And they had a drop T-grid ceiling in there at about 10 feet. So there was, you know, 25 feet of vertical space above that T-grid that was not being used. The space was very leaky, air drafts going through it. There was uh, mushrooms growing below the floor. It was in very, very poor condition. But all in all, the structure of the building was in very good condition. Uh, we just had to fix it up. Let's talk about the possibility and the potential to even have the second floor. Is it is it possible? We are at a pre-design meeting where we're getting input from the city staff. They're telling us what their physical space needs are and what the relationships are within this building. Yeah, what's going to come into play is the trusses that are eight foot off the floor. At that point, do away with the, the ramp going into City Hall, get a little more ceiling height, drop it down, and pick up another foot and a half of uh, Height. East and the north would be the two sides that we'd want to uh, strive to keep historic looking. Yes. Yes. And the uphill side and the south side are the two sides that we can, well, the uphill side is virtually buried. It's a building that was here at the time of the gold rush days and it's still here when the, the new gold is the, is the gaming community and the city of Blackhawk needs a tie from today's gaming to yesteryear. From the beginning of the project, it was important to maintain the historic aspect of this building because it is a 
contributing structure to the city of Blackhawk. So the design process on this was a lot of fun. We got to work hand in hand with the mayor, with the councilman, with the finance department, with the community planning department, and going back and forth with how we were going to take this one story building and double its square footage by adding a second floor. Before the asbestos abatement and finish removal process, it was necessary for myself uh, and Natalie moser a the structural engineer, to preview as much of the existing uh, structural system uh, as we could. Came up to the bell tower to look at how the old roof was framed and, and then we've discovered that uh, it was remodeled in modern times as it be, obviously began to sag. It's almost like this was the bearing elevation of the church all the way around. I bet that's what we'll find. The steeple itself has been reinforced with st steel and cabling. Okay, now from the bottom of the scissor, the bottom of the scissor to the bottom of the sheathing is 147. 148. All right. Some men spent a few days in here, didn't they? Making this work. So we climbed up and walked across the ceiling of the building and made some notes about what the sizes were for the vertical members, the horizontal members, the connections, etc. We are trying to do the feasibility review of how a floor could fit in here and we needed to know how stable and how the roof itself was connected. I just I just had to pull the bell one time. See, as we're endeavoring to save the bell and perhaps even make it so it's visible from the new second floor as a historical detail. And it's quite a nice bell. We've got a date of 1860s something, which is back when they built the church. As we get up here uh, this week, it looks like contractor has everything out of the building now. We've got uh, all of the Floor finishes and wall finishes, everything has been taken out. And then start working that, that one piece off and the same on the other side. We're going to cut a hole in the side of the wall here to allow machinery to go in and um, excavate. We don't normally want to cut a hole in the historic fabric of the building, but uh, we found what we believe to be the least intrusive place. There was already a door opening there that had been covered up over the years, so we cut a hole on the uh, south side of the building so we can get a small tractor uh, into the building that had a special hydraulic tip installed so they could hammer away at any of the bedrock that was actually impeding the construction of the work and putting in new foundations that would be frost protected. The city's made it very clear that they wanted to keep the, the exterior siding as much as possible and not remove any of it more than we have to. So even the stuff that was taken off the front for the access hole has been removed, stored, and will be put back up as it was before we took it down. It's a 130 year old building. We got to save everything and reuse it. They're also working on trying to level out the uh, exterior walls, which over the years have settled uh, at different rates. The contractor we can see has uh, started trying to get those into plumb, which is actually making the roof line look uh, much straighter than it was than when we started this project. Before we started this project, the space behind the building was in some areas of probably less than eight inches between the face of the building and the exterior rock face that was probably originally blasted out with dynamite by the, uh, the guys who were building this back in the 1860s. Right now we gotta scale this rock back about three feet and then we're gonna pin it so it doesn't slide. So we're gonna drill vertically, cut the rock so we don't knock off big chunks. And like I said, we're gonna take about three feet off of that rock so we have clearance for drainage and siding for workers to work back up in there. This is all granite rock, it's all like granite. They're trying to get that flat, get this ridge out of here. So that way it's secure and safe. Here yesterday we found the, the time capsule it was a rock with a hole chiseled out in the middle of it. Well, we had a hunch from the beginning that there was a time capsule in there. Our city clerks had uh, some documentation indicating that it was there. And it had a cork in the top of it that held the contents, and inside of it was two rolled up newspapers and an elevation view of Blackhawk. 
dated back to 1862. But there were rumors of uh, some valuable coins or some old gold and silver coins in there. They had seven cubic yards to begin with and it was in that last cubic yard, maybe the last half of a cubic yard where they found a little bag that contained some coins. Dating back to 1862 and all the projects that we've ever done, we've never found a, a time capsule like this and it, it goes to show that they wanted this to be found and uh, it, it's just an exciting find and not something that you find on most projects. We bought another plastic container that was pretty large and we put some historic photos in there and we put some of the old coins that we had found and some other city memorabilia and buried it under the wheelchair lift. It's a hundred years from now and they rehabilitate it again. I'm sure they'll have as much fun digging through there as we did digging through the stuff that we found, the newspapers and the coins. When the building was uh, originally constructed, they stacked these rocks to act as the foundation. We are going to be replacing that stacked rock with a concrete foundation and it'll also eliminate this timber. This existing foundation, the rock and the timber, is, has been here for 148 years and held up quite well. Hopefully the, the concrete foundation lasts that long as well. Right now we've got this elevated, excavated out. We're getting ready to pour a pier here. On top of that pier will be a three-foot grade beam to act as the new concrete foundation. This is a non-load bearing wall, so it's able to float in the air like this. And the next couple days, we'll pour that pier and put a post under it to support it just in case. Hit this side in. Well, you're flush there though. Just finishing bracing off the gable and getting it framed back in. Streamlining it, straightening it out, putting back the studs and nailing them, making sure it's all braced off for the roof, make it stronger. Uh, we're just beginning to do the underground in the building here. We just got this first uh, leg in here. It's our most shallow point. And we're going to work our way down to uh, where we have sleeves heading out of the building to the sewer. The foundation walls turned out great. Everything's within level. The building is now square. The tops of the walls and the roof have leveled out. Today we poured the concrete for the floor on the inside of the building in the new uh, kitchen. It's all a four inch slab and then a six inch slab at the entry all over compacted soil and it gives us our, our foundation for a new floor in there. Before there was all wood floor, wood joist over the dirt, so it's going to be a lot more solid, solid floor. Approximately about 15% into the project. It's not real far into it, but there's a lot of activity happening that uh, is really shaping up to allow things to happen a little bit quicker here soon. Can we're starting to swing in the uh, roof panels. They're going to provide a nice amount of insulation while allowing all of the historic interior framing to be exposed, especially the uh, historic scissor trusses, which are uh, we're really excited to see those once they get exposed. The building contained four historic trusses in the upper level, large timber beams, and those were concealed mostly by modern lumber. So all the modern lumber was removed from the ceiling and only the historic trusses remained. What we did is we installed a structural insulated panel, which is basically a sandwich panel of rigid insulation and plywood. And we had them craned in on top of the building and set them so that they span from one historic truss to the next without impacting any of the interior structure. We had to add some additional bracing to the trusses on the uh, city annex, timber frame, uh, the rafter units needed an additional steel plate. Just because of the age, the span, and uh, engineers felt that it would be much safer and last much longer if we added some plates to it. Well, we'll really start to see some activity happening on the inside with the framing happening and the interior really starting to take shape. Uh, we're framing the bathroom walls here and over there. About to start doing this back wall right here all the way across. Just framing, man. Just doing what I love. Plywood for the floor of the landing is what this is. The biggest challenge of the second floor was getting access to it, utilities to it, mechanical systems to it without impacting the height of the first floor. All the while still being able to walk the second floor without hitting your head on the trusses. So uh, one of the first things we did is we actually lowered the first floor a small amount to give us just enough headroom on the first floor, tucked all of our ductwork and electrical uh, mechanical systems into the space that's between the first and second floor. Kind of a maze, a very tight maze of uh, equipment in that, that space, but it worked out very well. It's a gravity retaining wall and it's substantial, it's thick, it has mortar and mud, 
and it's probably a 200 year model or a thousand year model time consuming a lot of labor intensive but it can come out and look nice when it's all done kind of an art i guess it's from putting puzzles together as a kid on the card table tearing off all the old siding and saving as much of it that isn't completely rotten to put back up for the historical part and just trying to save it and restore it back to its historical state it's another snowy day in blackhawk but we're still making progress yeah, weather is always a little concern. We have to take certain precautions when it's gonna snow. As we get to this point, we have drywall concerns and drywall mud, of course, takes some, some heat to cure out. That's one of the milestones in construction is the drywall phase. After all the structural work is completed, that it starts to define the areas, encapsulate space, and things take a whole different look and shape as we're doing the drywall work. Then we start looking at ceiling finishes. We'll start putting in the acoustic ceiling in the lower level. And then we have some uh, finished ceiling products that are going in the vaulted ceiling of the upper floor. This is metal clad armored cable. So uh, it carries your 120 volt to your outlet. This is gonna be fed from your panel. When they drywall, we'll put an outlet in this box. Kind of not cool to work on these old buildings, but it's a little different than the normal construction that we're used to. Okay, see if it'll slide in now. There we go. Yeah, we're installing windows at the uh, city annex today. Yeah. One historic part of the building that I found a lot of fun to work on were the exterior windows. We took the exterior windows that were there, they were a single pane, and in lieu of installing a storm window over it. It was more important to the client to maintain the accessibility of cross ventilation. We took those windows down, we recreated them with a double pane but still kept the center panes of the window operable so they could open up the windows in the summertime and get a nice cross breeze going through the uh, office spaces. The window on the second floor, although not historic, was a very important part to the mayor to get some natural lighting into the second floor. We worked back and forth through several uh, design alternatives to come up with a uh, alternative and window pattern that looked period appropriate for the building that was there using some of the shapes that were already on the existing building. Uh, shapes that were over the windows, the diamond shape, the triangular shapes. We created a, a large expanse of glass on that second floor, north facing, that provides an enormous amount of daylight into that second floor. There's a lot of different finishes taking place now, tile floors, tile in the bathrooms. We've just received our door delivery and they'll be installed shortly. We have the walls prepped in, in many cases, one coat of finish applied. And then of course we have acoustical ceiling to get in place as well, cover up all the utility work inside the ceiling. We're gonna go upstairs and we're gonna install the toilet upstairs. Seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, that's what comes to mind. When I see these fixtures going in. These louvers is, are, were broken or missing, and so I've replaced these, put in pieces that were missing or rotten, and redowled them on the ends. It's always a challenge to uh, recondition something to original state. It takes a lot of patience, and uh, I guess I've got that kind of patience. Solid, huh? got a lot of woodwork on the interior of the building. Most of it is a dug fir material. Very nice. The finishes here are, are just awesome and they blend well with the historic structure itself. One of the historic aspects that we thought was uh, very significant to this building as a church is the bell tower. So we made that a two-story space so as soon as you walk in you can look up all the way up to the bell that hasn't been seen in the last 15 years and we've restored the integrity of the structure that holds the bell to the point that we can ring the bell again. Water is our enemy here. So this thing had a few leaks in its past and we're, now we're dealing with those now to, to keep this thing standing for years to come. We don't want that bell to end up on the floor so we've got to do some structural work and uh, beef up the integrity of the whole tower. The bell tower is supported by four very large hand-hewn wood timbers, you know, about 12 inches uh, square, very rustic looking. We were sure to keep the existing uh, character of those without covering them up. 
let them shine through as the actual structure for the building. This is all out of the heart of the tree, so it takes a big tree to create a timber like this. And then unique craftsmen to like do all this mortise tenon work here. Uh, these are peg joints on a lot of these. These guys knew what they were doing and putting these together. Back rolling everything, you know, we'll go on and spray it to apply it, and then we're gonna back roll it all to uh, just give it that brush and roll look. When it's hand rolled, but you know, of course, that's how we started uh, as painters. Is there were no spray rigs. I'm blessed to be a part of this. I'm I'm truly thankful that I got to be a part of this. You know, I love uh, Colorado. I'm a native of Colorado, and not to mention, you know, it's just it's a beautiful building. It's it really is. You know, the architects did a great job, and it, and it was an honor. Honored to paint. So we're at the end of the project. We're nearly done. Getting really excited to see the end product. The contractor right now is working on some of the final touches with putting carpet down and, and final painting. And we've been working with uh, some other consultants to get a mural put up on one of the interior walls. We've got uh, some signage that we've been working on with a uh, manufacturer to put up some uh, what we're calling the heritage panels. So it's going to be a dedication to. All the people who have served on the council and mayor going all the way back to the 1860s. This building represents to the city of Black Hawk is a prodigious and remarkable repurposing of a very historic and iconic building in the city of Black Hawk. It's as much a museum as it is a public meeting facility. Around the walls you'll see surveys from 1866 and 1896 which are what the councils at the time would have looked at in order to determine what was going on in Black Hawk and the heritage panels that surround the walls give the inspiration to today's council as well as future city councils to continue to still make history in the city of Blackhawk. Yeah, you walk inside now and the first thing you see is four huge columns that are each about 30 feet tall and you look up, there's the bell. Then you walk up an intricate staircase with uh, lots of wood work and details and then you enter the, the council chambers and you look up again and you see these four exposed trusses and uh, it's a very impressive structure. The finished product of the dais uh, and the council chamber uh, I think has exceeded everyone's expectations of being a useful space that goes beyond just function but is a very beautiful space that expresses all of the historic structure that's been covered up for the last 15 years. Parts of the history that you can reach up and touch, they're not just there for show, they weren't added. Uh, the historic scissor trusses were really there and are still physically supporting the roof of the building. Today, September 25th, 2013, is the first meeting we will hold in the new Blackhawk City Council Chambers. Today, as we open the meeting, we will also begin a new tradition in the city of Blackhawk, and that will be the ringing of the bell from the old Presbyterian Church to open every city council meeting. And in fact, the two individuals who will inaugurate this new tradition are William and Dolores Spellman, my parents. This building that we're standing in right now is, was up most very important to the, to the Blackhawk community. It's, it's been here all these years, and all these years it's been important to Black Hawk. To have this, to renovate it in the shape it's in now, it, it has a great deal of meaning. Here we have the deed where the Black Hawk School purchased the Presbyterian Church, this building, for $600 in 1907. And here we have an award given to the Black Hawk School District for premium school work in 1906. At that time, the Black Hawk School only had eight grades. In 1907, the mothers of Black Hawk, based on the school district winning this award, asked the school district to extend the grades through the 10th grade. This is a very historical and significant document to the city of Black Hawk. This is the original land grant from the federal government to the city of Black Hawk, dated 1867 and signed by President Rutherford B. Hayes. What this project represents to the city of Black Hawk is a prodigious and remarkable repurposing of one of the most historic and iconic buildings in the city of Black Hawk. It's remarkable to think that this entire second floor, these council chambers did not exist prior to this project. Today, this building is as much a museum as it is uh, a public meeting room. This project represents the manifestation 
of Blackhawk's motto, which is preserving the past, preparing for the future, and still making history. For the general contractor and the uh, subcontractors who worked on this project, there was a lot of care taken to maintain all of the historic structure. The ladder to the bell tower that had been installed back in the 1860s was taken apart piece by piece and numbered, set aside, and then reinstalled after our finishes went in. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort to build a project like this, to have the foresight, to bring in the guys who do the steps in the right order, and for a project of this difficulty, to construct the, the foundation and the framing, and then to move directly into the drywall and the finishes. It was good, we had skilled craftsmen working on the project, and it came out nice. These were the early settlers to Colorado, these are the structures they put up, and as a Coloradan, it's personal goal to embrace that and replenish it, refresh it. Yesterday we were up in there, and on the bell itself, there's an inscription. It says, uh, "Blessed be to those who hear the sound." So we want that to continue ringing for quite some time. It's really exciting to see them come together. When you first start a project, the building may look dilapidated, but the structure's there. And all we do is we just bring them back to their original condition. The ambiance of what was there when it was put together is still relevant today, and it's evident in, 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 in the final outcome. It makes me feel really good. It not only does it bring out more of the history of Black Hawk, but it also brings out more of the history of Colorado. This is where Colorado became a state. It was off the mining industry, and you know, you're right here in the heart of it. Here in Blackhawk. For one thing, I love the area. You know, I was raised here. I, I've been here all my life, so we can do these things, and it makes me happy. By us preserving these things today, when they get a hold of them in the future, they have pride, and therefore, because they have that pride, they can understand why to preserve it for a future beyond themselves. Blackhawk is really unique because it's taken advantage of the, of the gaming industry we have and, and the money that's coming in. And we've uh, really helped Black Hawk out. And now it's a outstanding city that's got beautiful buildings, beautiful houses, and the roads and everything, all the infrastructure is redone. We're really proud of what we've done. It's a wonderful feeling just to see that our history will be preserved, that we'll be able to pass this along to future generations and know that we had a, a hand, a big part in uh, guaranteeing that others will be able to enjoy our community as much as we have. <laughs>